everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming again. I, I'm, I'm glad I didn't scare you off yesterday. Um, there was a few questions that came in overnight. I uh, just wanted to sort of summarize those um, first and maybe address those first. But uh, actually, before we do that, let's just go a really, really quick overview of what we did yesterday. So, um, you know, the, the, purpose of, the purpose of this clinic is to introduce you to uh, uh, deep learning workflows for image segmentation. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly difficult um, clinic because there's a lot of code. And, you know, that unfortunately, you're being exposed to uh, probably more code than you would like or that you're used to at this point, uh, especially if you're start, starting out with Python and especially if you're starting out with, with machine learning. Um, but, but this is like a real, real world, quote unquote, workflow that, you know, it's sort of typical. Um, deep learning is still new enough uh, that it doesn't have a lot of canned software that you can just sort of install on your computer and run with. Uh, that's becoming a little bit more popular, but for the most part, people are accessing these tools, these algorithms, these ideas by making their own Python scripts. Um, and so it does require um, a certain amount of Python knowledge in order to do this stuff. Um, but, but with that in mind, you know, um, there's, there's, there's a lot that you can, uh, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot that you can do without understanding every part of this code. Um, and, you know, I wanted at, at least to show you a sort of a working uh, example of how you might um, do land cover landscape type uh, classification using the sorts of imagery that geomorphologists and ecologists are, you know, are now more sort of routinely acquiring, so just from drones and from planes. Um, so that's the sort of scale that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of addressing here. Um, it doesn't mean that this workflow is not transferable to smaller or larger scales. Um, we've, we, we talked a little bit about the transferability of these techniques to satellite imagery. Yes, that's possible. Um, there's a few uh, different, uh, there's a few considerations that you need to take um, in terms of how you organize your data. Um, but, but, but in principle, these methods do apply to any type of sort of spatial problem. Um, and the same goes for very small scale imagery as well. I've used, personally, I've used these techniques on uh, very close range photographs and they, they, they do an awesome job in general at, at, at many of the tasks that you throw at them. Um, but that isn't to say that you don't need to be very careful about what data that you give it and how you frame the problem. This is just a tool like any other that you need to understand how to use. Um, so, so just to recap then of what we did yesterday, um, we downloaded a publicly available data set called Aeroscapes, which is a set of RGB um, photographs of various types of landscapes, um, various places, various types of categories of landform, uh, sorry, land cover for the most part. Those are the categories that we looked at, um, or to, sorry, that's contained in the imagery. Uh, the category that we looked at was vegetation. And we just designed a, um, a neural network to essentially segment the vegetation pixels from the imagery. And we weren't con too concerned about any other classes. Today, we're going to look at some of those other classes. Um, so we downloaded the data. We made lists. We, had, we looked at workflows to plot the imagery uh, with sort of the label sort of trans semi-transparent over the top. And um, we started to develop an understanding of how to model workflows like this together, starting with um, uh, the concept of feeding models, uh, batches of images, which is typically how models are trained. Uh, and so we, look, we first looked at this sort of concept of generating batches of images by making our own generator function with a yield command at the bottom. Uh, so we can generate random batches of, of those imagery and their, and their corresponding masks. Um, we then, uh, well, we just explored that batch generation, then we built a model. Um, we talked a little bit about the UNET model. Um, we looked at, a, hopefully looked at the video that explained it, but we also talked about sort of the, the basics of what it did and why it works so well. Um, and today I'd like to touch on a few of those topics again, um, because we didn't fully explain what the residual part of the residual UNET meant. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we talked a little bit about class imbalance. Um, class imbalance is the situation that's very common um, for landscapes, which is that you have many, many more pixels uh, of one class compared to another, or of one class compared to many others. Um, so in our case, vegetation um, wasn't as, it was quite dominant, but it wasn't the most dominant class in our imagery. And lots and lots of imagery only had very small pieces of vegetation 
and some of the imagery had very large patches of uh, vegetation. Generally, it's a class imbalanced problem. There are fewer pixels of vegetation compared to others. If you were to look at other classes, and hopefully a few of you did, um, looking at boats and people and animals and things like that, there's an even more, there is the, the class imbalance issue is even greater um, because those objects tend to be very small compared to the, to the landscape elements. So we looked at this function called, uh, uh, we, we, we looked into this um, uh, using um, a dice coefficient in order to try and get around some of those problems. And I'll talk, I, if you want, I can talk more about that. Um, we, we made our model, we, we sort of saved that model to disk and we had a look at that model in terms of its graph structure and we looked and we talked a little bit about this, this diagram here. We talked a little bit about these very long skip connections, which are these very long arrows that you can see that sort of um, connect the, the top of the, model, the, of the model to the bottom of the model. And we, and we sort of covered why those occur or why those are important. Those are essentially uh, how units uh, are able to um, discover low level features as well as high level features. It takes the image, it passes it through a series of layers to extract the very low level features. And then what it does in the end is it, it just sort of uh, merges the feature maps uh, from the low level features uh, with a set of feature maps that have been inherited from the, from the image without much filtering. And that preserves some of the higher level um, features or the, or the finer detail features within the imagery. Uh, and that's essentially why units are so popular and why they're so useful. Um, we train the model just for a few um, number of training epochs uh, with our own custom callback function that we use to plot an example of a validation image as we went. The validation images are those images that are used by the model to evaluate how good it's, uh, what you use to evaluate how good the model's doing as it trains. The training data are those images that it uses to actually set the weights within the model to optimize and converge towards a good solution. Um, there's a third set of data that we sort of set aside that we called the test set, and that's for testing. Uh, it's an independent set of data that's sort of drawn randomly like the other two sets, and um, that, that's used to evaluate how good the model is. Um, we trained the model just for just five epochs, as I said. Um, we stored the, the weights inside um, a, a, a container, um, an H5 file format, and um, sort of format file. We trained the model. And, um, oh, this is a hang up from yesterday's code. Let me get rid of that. And, um, sorry, yesterday's lesson. We trained the model, we had a look at it, we found it was, was pretty good. And we talked a little bit about uh, the units. So, uh, oh, and we looked at some of the training history. So the training history here, what you're looking at, if you remember on, on the left-hand side here is, is the, um, the blue dashed line is the training uh, dice coefficient. That uh, takes a value between zero and one. The closer to one is better. You can sort of think of that as an accuracy score. It's the degree to which the uh, pixels are actually overlapping uh, between the prediction and the, and the ground truth mask. Um, and we saw that the validation set was bouncing around. And you would have got different curves. You would have got different um, curves to me because we were, we're training on small batches um, and they are randomly drawn from a very large training set. So it's very unlikely that we actually trained on the same uh, individual images and it's in, and I would say it was impossible that we trained on the same sequence of images so we're going to have slightly different results all model train all neural networks train iteratively and they converge towards a solution over very uh, over it can be a very long time typically several hours if you're training over um, tens to hundreds or thousands of, of training epochs um, so which is also probably why um, when you ran the evaluate command, you probably all got slightly different results because the model that it's using was trained using different, it saw different images. So um, that's a very, very quick overview and recap of yesterday. Um, today, and be be before I field some questions, today I wanted to move on to a, a, a common, um, situation especially for our, our scientific fields uh, and that's where you don't have enough imagery to start with um, what what strategies are available for us to sort of kickstart a model or to use another data set to examine whether our data set is going to be useful with this within this model framework now one uh, really cool thing about machine learning is that uh, that 
the the practice of taking the outputs from another model and directly using them in your model is totally acceptable um, and it's encouraged even because um, you know one of the real problems with applying these deep learning algorithms is of course that um, that you can almost never have enough data and that they are data hungry and they require a lot of examples to learn from um, because you know the, the training process is essentially unsupervised um, so we are going to move on today and talk a little bit about that uh, as uh, in the first sort of hour and then hopefully in the second hour we're going to move on to the second part uh, which is contained in the second um, notebook and in that one we're going to talk about what's called a multi-class segmentation problem and all that means is that instead of just um, uh, having one feet uh, one class of interest now we've got many so we're going to look at vegetation, but we're also going to look at a bunch of other classes and combine them all together in the end. Uh, so we have a, a semantic segmentation, uh, which is a segmentation where every part of the image is, is something that we can ascribe meaning to. So um, before I go on to the transfer learning, does anyone have any questions about um, what we covered yesterday? Um, I, I, I do have a couple of things that I'm going to address that I've written down here that I'm going to bring up as, as I go. Um, one is going to be, um, uh, you know, how do we, how do you take this uh, code and actually use it on your own data? I'm going to talk about that at the end. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the transfer learning, uh, the, the elevation data that came up. Uh, there was a couple of questions from folks who, who wanted to use these techniques with elevation. Um, it's more experimental. There's fewer people who have, ex have convincingly demonstrated that elevation is enough to segment landscapes in meaningful ways, but that's not to say it's not been done. Uh, it is technically possible. You can feed these neural networks um, it, uh, raster stacks of anything between one and whatever, um, however many dimensions you have in your data. With elevation data, you typically have just one band, which is elevation, but you might also have uh, derivative products like slope and aspect and things like that that you may throw at the problem. Other people have done that within uh, many times within classical machine learning frameworks like random forest and so support vector machines and things like that. Um, so I, I don't think that um, it would, I, I think it is worthwhile trying, um, but I don't have any particular perspectives on it um, other than, um, you know, it's more experimental. You have to choose your classes correctly because if you're just using elevation data, obviously um, you have to make sure that your classes zone out by elevation, which is obviously, you, you know that, and it's an obvious point to make, but um, the more you can do that, obviously the better. And uh, you know, if you have two classes that exist in um, the same elevation zone, then they may be they may be in different spatial locations. So the so the model has something to work with. Uh, the model knows that this particular class is only in the you know in this particular portion of the image. Um, but in general, it, you know, you probably want some other covariate to sort of use within the model as well as elevation to actually you know uh, bounce that idea off internally. If that makes sense. Um, so before I move on here, uh, let me have a quick look at the chat and um, I'll take any questions you have um, at this point. I'm going a little bit faster today because I realize the, um, I realize we have still quite a lot to cover. Okay, a couple of you have got errors. I'll, um, I'm not too sure where those errors are occurring. Um, let me get back to those. Jason says, did, uh, did your workflow include code to look at the total area of different classes across all the training imagery? Um, no, that's a good point. That's a good thing to do. Um, so what Jason means there, I think that's referring to the class imbalance problem. So one way to actually verify whether you have class imbalance would be obviously to enumerate the number of pixels that you have for every class. Um, so that would be a, a, a simple um, matter of loading in all of your imagery and just counting the number of pixels that you have in each class and then perhaps making a histogram or something like that. Um, I could certainly make a note to update that. That would be a simple update that I can make for this, for this, um, for this, um, this workflow. So thanks for that. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. But yes, there would be ways that you could examine, you know, the total area covered by, by, every, by every 
class obviously you need to know what the pixel resolution was uh, but you could just do it from the from the purposes of the model training it doesn't know how big every pixel is there isn't any way to build that information there's no easy way to build that information in to a model framework like this so um, it's not really using that information to sort of to, to come up with a solution um, but that's not to say that it's that space is not important as I said yesterday the convolution um, the convolution filters are set up in such a way that they share uh, weight spatially and so that's how they're able to to upscale the image uh, from the small bottleneck that's created which is the feature the sort of essential features of the image that's useful for prediction um, and if everyone's still with me then I'll, I'll move on to the next thing. Um, these errors, I'm not entirely sure. Chris and Paola, I'm not entirely sure where these errors are coming in. Uh, hopefully I can find them and... Uh, don't, don't, don't worry about that now. Yeah. Uh, um, it's, it's the first time you train the data and I just ran the file from the top and got that error, so. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I, I, I may have... Uh, Oh, and Paula's fixed hers. Awesome. I may have in the same problem, but uh, I'm just trying to figure out where that is exactly. All right. So transfer learning. So this is uh, this in this part we're going to take the uh, we it, during the during the training process yesterday we wrote out a file. Um, it had an H5. It's an HDF5 format file, uh, binary format. You can't see it with your eyes, but you can read it into almost any software, and it it knows what to do with it. Um, Keras knows what to do with it because um, the, the, the model weights are sort of stored in a very prescribed way. So when it reads those files in, it just it, it literally allocates the weights as it needs to, as it goes uh, to the different model layers. And there's obviously many, many, many of these uh, different weights that, uh, that are essentially controlling the, um, the way that this neural network comes to its solution. Um, there's also a bunch of biases um, in there as well, which they, they go hand in hand. So in general, those those are called parameters of the model. They're, they're, the, the parameters are the things in a deep learning model that the model figures out through training. Hyperparameters are the things that we um, have decided that are, uh, that would include for our uh, case yesterday, that would include the batch size, um, it would include uh, the, the image size, um, it would include the, the, optimi the particular optimizer that we use, the loss function that we use, and the metrics that we use and things like that. Um, but they also would refer to decisions that are made within the model itself, um, such as how many convolution layers that we want, how many pooling layers and things like that. Um, but in general, hyperparameters are just those things that uh, pertain to a specific model that you can control. The parameters um, are the things that are learned by the model and that's the, those are the things that we're transferring over. It only works because all of the hyperparameters stay the same. The, um, the batch size is going to be the same in this time. The, the image size is going to be the same. We're going to use the same model, obviously, because that's how we transfer the weights over. So um, this is typically how you would start with your own problem. You would take, I mean, uh, or I don't know if it's typical, but that's certainly what I would encourage. You would take um, a, a similar data set that someone else has maybe looked at or uh, has labels for, and you'd play around with that data set if it, if it seemed like it was going to be pertinent to your particular issue, uh, your particular task or problem. So if you were looking at vegetation in, in Landsat imagery or, or whatever, uh, you might take uh, some um, vegetation classifier that had been made for MODIS or Sentinel or something else, and you just might want to transfer it over before you started from scratch. If you've got UAV imagery like we have, then obviously, you know, if you wanted to segment out water or a particular plant or a particular feature of interest, there might be already somebody who's done something like that. Or there might be a, a set of classes out there that are similar for you, um, that look similar yeah, with respect to your spatial resolution and things like that. Um, but another way that people tend to, to do this is actually uh, to just tr uh, transfer the weights from models that have been trained on imagery that is completely different. Um, you see, oftentimes you see people um, sort of transfer weights from a uh, from what's called ImageNet, which is a uh, you know a, a very very large set of a million images of everything that you can possibly imagine. It's got a thousand different categories. Um, oh, apparently everyone. Several people were in the um, ah, 
sorry about that. I didn't realize everyone was in, well, a few people were in the waiting room. Um, and yeah, sorry about that. So, um, so a lot of people use uh, weights that have been transferred from this thing called ImageNet. Um, million images, thousand categories. And it, that the, the intuition behind that is that you transfer weights over from a convolutional neural network that has the ability to recognize stuff in images. Um, low level features, high level features, and mid level features that are, you know, sort of generic things that, that you find in imagery, um, you know, corners, lines, um, intersections of lines, vertices, and, and things like that um, as low level features. And then that sort of might translate to higher level features, such as specific textures of a specific spatial structure um, or specific spectral structure for that matter. Um, so so transfer learning is extremely common. We're not going to take the weights for, that have been learned on a generic set like ImageNet. We're just going to take the weights that we learned that, uh, that we had our model learn yesterday, and we're going to transfer it to a different data set um, for this for this essentially the same uh, classification task. Uh, the data set we're going to be using is called the Semantic Drone data set. I did talk a little bit about it yesterday, but just to recap, it has uh, it's somewhat similar um, in that it, it's you know sort of UAV or drone imagery that's been taken from about 10 to 30, I think, meters off the ground. Um, it, there's, more, there's more of the, um, oh, there's fewer images, but there's more categories, many more categories, it turns out. And the landscape isn't really a natural landscape. It's more of a housing development or something like that. There are natural elements in it, like vegetation, water, and things like that. But for the most part, it's sort of a residential suburban scene. But we're going to see um, how well our vegetation weights transfer over. So hopefully, um, oh, and of course, because I was talking so much, I didn't actually uh, finish running my own notebook. So maybe I'm going to discover the same errors as everyone else had um, as I do this. Uh, bear with me just a second as I just skip through some of this stuff so I'm able to then um, take the rest. Um, so essentially what we're going to do, we're going to download the data like we did before. Um, it's, I've, I've hosted it on a Google Drive like I did before. Um, it's a subset of the data, um, just so you know. The full set of data you can acquire online is much bigger. Um, both of these data sets I've provided links to, so if you were to uh, download them yourselves, um, obviously you cared, uh, but they're much bigger um, in terms of, like there's a few different versions of these data that exist. Um, for example, uh, different subsets and things like that. Um, but you'll, you'll get a sense for it if you find these data useful. But otherwise you could just use the subsets that I curated for the purposes of this class. So I'm, um, apologies here, I'm just getting down to the point where um, you probably have already exceeded me and uh, I'm just trying to get to this point here. Um, so maybe I can just go straight to this. This is going to take a while, isn't it? Oh, of course, I'm training my model. Apologies for this. This is uh, unprofessional of me. Let me go. Let me just go straight down to I think where I can revisit this. This is another uh, difficulty with using Google Colab is obviously you have to sort of run things sequentially, and oftentimes if you don't, if you miss a cell. You're scratching your head for a few minutes thinking, hold on, what the hell? It worked a minute ago. It's probably because you just didn't run a cell up, up above. Um, so what I'm doing here is just um, lay, uh, is, uh, downloading a zip file that contains the, the images and a zip file that contains the labels. The images are different in this respect because they're much larger, but we're going to actually use the same size of image. Uh, partly because I just wanted to demonstrate that you, this this model can still be effective if, even if you're uh, radically sort of downsizing your imagery, which some uh, some hardware configurations or most hardware configurations sort of uh, necessitate. Um, and so what I just did there um, is just unzip those two folders into um, a couple of different uh, places. If you use uh, the the files. Uh, tab over over on the left hand side of your window and uh, you might need to hit refresh then you'll see a new folder that's been made that's called quarter and each one of these jpeg images is is an image of uh from the data set 
and you can click on on one of those it might take a minute to load uh, but you can click on these these images and it will load them up um, and you can see that the imagery is a bit different um, in terms of its sort of resolution much much higher resolution imagery and the labels are color labels they uh, they've been made um, in color and so each one each each individual class here has a has three unique uh, color values that we're going to have to unpack and so that's the that's the first task that we're going to do um, so i'm using the uh, i'm just using this uh, so OS stands for operating system and walk just means it's just going to walk through a top level directory and give me everything under it. So what this piece of code does is essentially just uh, cycle through just this uh, folder and gives me all of the images within it. But if, they'd, if, it, if it'd been um, organized with subfolders, it would do essentially the same thing and preserve the paths for me. So um, because I've got that in such a way, um, I can now just use uh, this this type of list comprehension in Python to just go through the images and figure out which ones are, are the sample images, the color photographs, because those are the ones that have the JPEG extension and the labels, which are those, uh, the labels, which are the, the categories, uh, which have the PNG extension. So in this, in this case, it's fairly simple to just break that out. The original data set consists of 400 images. Um, and the reason why this is called quarter is because we're only using 100 of them. And that's just because these are, um, because uh, just for the purposes of speed, really. But uh, the original data set has 400. And so if you wanted to work with this data set, I encourage you to download the original. Um, these are our classes. I've got them in a class dictionary um, for a specific reason. Uh, so uh, that will become apparent later on. A dictionary um, in Python is actually something that, this might be confusing for folks, a dictionary is actually something that's like this. So uh, you might have uh, the, the, the value, you've got the name of something, and then you have the value of that something. So your value there would be some variable that's in your uh, Python workspace. Um, but what I mean here is, uh, is it's just a, a class, uh, let's just call it a class data structure because it's actually not a classically a dictionary because it's not uh, it's not got these curly brackets um, and then this is a tuple anything in Python that has the it's sort of surrounded by uh, these parentheses is a tuple so basically this is a list consisting of many tuples and dictionary was a poor choice of word Here I'm just extracting only the names because I want to have a variable for later on that just contains the string names. Um, and later on, and in a minute, I'm going to extract these RGB color values because I need those values to decode um, and, and um, make a, make a two-dimensional label image out of my three-dimensional label image. Uh, it's three-dimensional because it has three bands, R, G, and B. Um, and so I want to take those three bands and those many colors, those tuple colors, and basically uh, condense them into a two-dimensional array so we can feed it, uh, or matrix, sorry, so we can feed it into the, um, into the neural network. So here um, I'm, at, I'm prepending this quarter to, uh, to my file names here because it's not, uh, not going to know that it's in the quarter directory. And here I'm defining a function that is just going to read uh, an image into memory and a label into memory and resize them to the size that we want. We've got rectangular images that are several thousand pixels in each dimension, but the version of the images that we're going to give to the model is actually square and, and only 512. Um, we're going to see that uh, that's, that doesn't, that's not going to be a problem like it sounds. Um, lots of conventional geospatial work would obviously, this would be really a bad thing to do you don't want to downsize your imagery um, but for the purposes of the neural network we have to make sure that uh, our, our, all of our data fits with uh, um, with on, onto our GPU memory and as I said yesterday our GPU memory is very limited so unless you have very very large GPUs um, or very very small high resolution images that you've chopped up then a common strategy would just be to take your big image and just sort of make it smaller. Uh, it's not necessarily ideal, but it does work okay. And hopefully I'll convince you of that. Um, but an alternative workflow, of course, would be to take these large images and to chop them up into smaller images. 
Um, we did have a question yesterday from Zoltan who asked, you know, whether the, there would be consistencies between the tiles. So I'll try and remember to get to that, but yes, there should be. And I'm going to show you a, a technique right at the end of today, hopefully if we get there, um, that will show you how to deal with any type of discontinuities that do exist if you do chop up your imagery and use a model to predict. So um, I realize I'm going a little faster than yesterday, uh, but hopefully I'm still you know, uh, hopefully I'm still making sense. Really, we're just at the point here where um, we're just defining our own color map uh, based on these uh, RG RGB values uh, that have been given to us by the people who made the data. We're just, um, we're reading in um, the, the, that array of, of RGB color values and we're dividing them by 255 because we want to turn them from an 8-bit integer into a float between 0 and 1. Um, because only because this particular function from matplotlib listed color map is expecting the, the, the colors to be in RGB but in zero to one format. Um, and here we're making a, an, a, an, a, a plot of an example image drawn from the catalog with a semi-transparent uh, label image on the top. And you can see that these labels are quite detailed. Uh, they've gone in and they've uh, done a, a very good job uh, being uh, sort of careful about not mislabeling. Um, and so this data is, is a very good data set to sort of cut your teeth with some of these uh, different uh, algorithms because it's, it's probably the size of images that you're sort of uh, used to, um, you know, a sort of a more than 10 megapixel. Um, and it's many classes, which is also probably more like what you, some of the tasks that you might anticipate needing these techniques for. Um, but the, the problem we have with this type of data set right now is that these colors are in, the, these are colors, they're in RGB color space, and we need to turn them into labels that are just integers that we can feed to our model. The model is not going to understand what to do with um, a, a color vector. Um, it just wants an integer to know what every class is. And so without going into the details, because we don't have the time, this function here really just takes that RGB image and it just looks up um, what the colors are within that, uh, within that sort of list of colors that I made. And it just assigns an integer to each of the colors in such a way that um, you have as many integers among the entire label uh, collection as you do labels that you're interested in or, or is containing or is that that are contained within the data. Um, I will stop in a minute to ask answer questions but I just want to get to this point here where um, I'm essentially uh, I'm first of all I'm removing the unlabeled category. Um, unlabel is difficult to deal with because what does that really mean? Uh, is it unlabeled because they just didn't get around to labeling it or is it unlabeled because they couldn't fit it into their classification scheme? I imagine it's probably the latter. Um, so it's really unknown and we don't know what to do with unknown. So um, for this purposes of this class, I'm just going to get rid of it. We're just not going to use it. For the purposes of what we're doing, we're just trying to see whether we can replicate the type of vegetation segmentation that we achieved with the last data set by using those weights. Um, but in the next lesson, uh, we'll, we'll revisit this a little bit more uh, in terms of the unknown class and why that's a problem, uh, but also why it's not really a problem because uh, it really does depend on how you frame the problem. Um, so let me, um, let me, uh, so this is, this is where we have taken our label image, our RGB label, and we flattened it down to two dimensions. So it's now just a, a single matrix of, of integers. And here, um, this is just a handy way to just grab an arbitrary color map, but in discrete form. Um, instead of uh, like we did before, uh, where we sort of defined the color map based on the actual RGB values given to us. And yesterday when we gave it discrete colors, that were sort of in intuitive to us, you know, cyan for sky and green for vegetation, things like that. Here I'm showing you a third way that you may get at this uh, by making a color map. And that's by just using this, um, this command, get cmap. And what it does, it just takes um, any of the existing built-in color maps or color ramps um, in matplotlib and will just give you a discrete, a discrete number of colors. And that's just the length of, our, of our, the, the number of classes that we have. So I've got a new color map here that when I plot this image now, it's going to just uh, give us this 
semi-transparent mask. Um, no, of course it's not, because I didn't run the code. So this time it's going to give us our semi-transparent label, uh, but it's going to be in a different color space. And this time the label is just integers. So before I go on to preparing for the model training, um, does anyone have any questions while I have a look at the chat? I realize I'm going a little fast today, but um, that's only because I do want to try to get to the end. Um, okay, so there's no new questions on the chat, so I'm going to assume you're okay, but if, if you did want to unmute yourselves and ask questions, that would also be fine. All right. So if we go back to our class list up here. Then one second, there is a question. Uh, oh, okay. From Parchi. It's in the chat, I can read it out. Um, okay. Sure, I've got it. Yeah, so any pre-processing required for shadow? That's a good question. Uh, possibly, yeah, it, depends, it really does depend on how bad your shadows are. I mean, I would say that it, the, the imagery that you see is not the image, the form of the image that is actually used by the model to do the classific, uh, to do the prediction. You know, it, the, the models, the, the models are set up in such a way that they are quite good at extracting features even in the presence of significant noise um, and even in the presence of significant shadows but to a point um, it really does depend you know a little bit it, de it depends on you know the sort of the bit depth and the color space and the compression and uh, the, the various factors that went into making your your image you know like um, we're not using raw imagery, we're using sort of JPEG or, or something like that that's been heavily modified and compressed. So there's that, you know, there's that to pay attention to. Um, and obviously the, the best version of the image that you have um, to give to the model is the one that you want to use. But also the model is quite good at extracting features in the presence of noise. Um, I've worked a lot in Grand Canyon. There's a lot of, uh, almost every photograph you ever take anywhere in Grand Canyon has a very dark shadow in it. But even 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 in the presence of those shadows, uh, you can still use these type of techniques to to see what uh, the landscape is composed of. But so the short answer is um, yes, if you can, but only if you know what you're doing. Otherwise, let the model do it and see how well it works. But obviously, if it's really really uh, deleterious, then you need to sort of address it before you give it to the model. But it's a good question, thanks. And, you know, shadows, you know, things like that, they come up a lot with the types of imagery that uh, we might be using as ecologists and geomorphologists because obviously, you know, we have the, the vagaries of weather and light to always deal with. A lot of the, um, you know, the lot, uh, that's also a lot of the, the limitations with some of the, the, the materials that you see presented, you know, in blog posts and in papers and, and especially those categories uh, um, and models that are trained on sort of anthropocentric classes. You don't have the same uh, sort of issues necessarily with uh, lighting variation, things like that, as you would at landscape scale. So those sorts of considerations are definitely, are definitely good. Okay, so if we, if we go back to the list of the classes that are actually contained within this data set, I guess we can just look at the, uh, the, uh, the color bar here. Um, you'll see that there's a few different vegetation types. And so, you know, without really going into too many details about, you know, what type of vegetation is in there, I thought we would just sort of throw them all in together as one generic vegetation class. But I would encourage you to, you know, to, to redo this, uh, re, uh, re go, run, run through this workflow again with different combinations of those or with different classes, obviously. It's only by doing that that you're going to sense of how, get a sense of really how powerful this model is for this particular problem. Um, but for the purposes of today, we're going to combine the grass, the trees, and the vegetation classes together. And you know, the other reason why I wanted to show that is because that's also a fairly common workflow that you may encounter. Um, you know, where your the 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 model that you want to transfer weights from to your data set, um, they may not have exactly the same classes, as I said, but they may have something similar, or you might combine them or separate them out in a way that suits you. Um, so here I just made a list of these class, class foregrounds, I'm calling them the classes that we're interested in, vegetation, trees, and grass. Um, but obviously that could just be any number of those classes. You, know, you, you could just give it the one class if you wanted, but I'm going to give it three. And then this next little bit, that just goes through 
and it's just a piece of, of um, code that will just extract where that class is found within the list of classes that we made earlier, the text list of just the names of those classes. And it will just append them to this, uh, th this n list that I have. And so n in the end is just a, a list of three numbers. Um, those those uh, classes as they are represented in the in the in the in the set of labels and their num numeric value. So we're going to be looking. We're going to basically tell the model to treat as vegetation any pixel within our label image that is either a three, an eight, or a nineteen. And we're going to call them all one thing: vegetation. Here we're using basically the same batch generator that we used yesterday, but this time we've modified it a little bit because uh, specifically because we've got slightly different uh, way in which our data sets organized. Uh, if you recall yesterday, our Aeroscapes data was contained in these two folders, JPEG images and segmentation class. So we had a little lining there that said, uh, grab an image um, and, and sort of replace uh, this folder with that folder. This time we've got everything just in one folder. So we're just basically telling it to just grab it, grab an image and replace it with the, the thing, with, the, with a different extension, because you'll see that the images and the, lab and the corresponding labels are identical except the extension. So that's actually a really convenient way to do it and to organize your data. And then um, the next thing it does, it just cycles through each of our classes in N and, um, and uh, just appends them to a, a single binary mask, essentially. So what we get in the end is a binary mask where uh, the ones in the image are associated with any one of those three or all of those three vegetations, and then um, the zeros are everything else. So it essentially functions in exactly the same way as, as the previous batch generator that we used. Um, and so, and so here I just generated um, a, a, a set of images using the same batch size as yesterday, which was eight, I believe. Um, and so X and Y are X's, X's are the images and Y's are the labels. And so the length of those two should be eight. But the size of any one of those will be two, uh, 500, uh, 512 by 512 by three if it's an image um, and 512 by 512 oops caps lock 512 five, by 512 if it's a label but it actually um, appends this extra one uh, to the image as well because it, it's expect the model is expecting that and that appears in this expand dims uh, expand dimensions there and I'm saying expand my third dimension the first, the zeroth dimension here is just the, uh, the the sequence of where that the image is in the batch. So the first, so if I were to treat this like that, then I've got my um, my individual, my my first or zeroth label, uh, and my first or zeroth um, image. And this little bit of code is just telling me well which which one of those image contains my class, and it turns out that. Well, in the in particular one that I ran, you're going to get something slightly different because this is randomized. But the one that I ran told me that each one of my images in my batch had that class in it. And I can verify that by obviously plotting them. And this also gives a sense of what the data looks like. You can see that because this is randomized, um, it's actually grabbed the same image a couple of times, which is interesting. Never seen that before. But um, it's also because the image set that we have is a lot smaller than yesterday. We're only working with 100 images this time. Yesterday, we were working with a couple of thousand. OK, I'll just quickly consult the chat. Kerry says, can you give an ecology geomorphology example? Is training a new model to distinguish between plant species feasible? Oh, that's a really specific question. That's part of my own research. Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> I think is the is the honest answer to that question. Whether yeah, or not these... I didn't mean to derail you. I just was wondering when you're using all these training images of drones and pavement, if this can move beyond that. Yes, but it can. if it's too sure. long of a question, I won't derail us. Yes, I, I would say I'm confident that yes, it can. Um, but it does depend on how you you know you frame the problem and how much data you have. I think the, the from what I've seen so far is that these un, these residual UNET models are very powerful discriminators of objects that are um, very obvious to your own eyes. 
At the end here, I'm going to show you, I, I developed another class that's sort of a more advanced version of this class that actually does go through a really specific ecology example using this exa exact same model to identify intertidal uh, oyster reefs. And I'll show you that at the end um, if you wanted to take that further. And that's, that's sort of an example, it's the best example that I have for how well this model might work on a, a, a noisy, difficult data set that may be more what you're used to if you're a, a remote sensor working in ecology because obviously the some of the signals that you're looking for are pretty small uh, that's not gonna i'm not gonna i'm not gonna extend my confidence to saying that it's going to be able to identify individual species of plants because a i don't i really don't it's not my area and b it's entirely possible that there's not enough distinguishing colors and textures um at every part of their growth cycle or whatever that would give you that reliability uh, but I would encourage you to just look into it for sure so um, here I've, I've like I did yesterday in order to try to um, get us looking at roughly the same thing even though we're training on random batches we're going to be using at least the same starting point the same set of training files testing files and validation files. And they have been allocated by myself but randomly using this code that's commented out at the bottom if you wanted to try and replicate that. Um, and it, again, it's like I did yesterday, it's a 50, 25, 25 split. I, I, want, more, I want more training data than I, uh, than I want validation and testing data. Um, but that's not to say that that's always gonna be the case. You, you may find that um, giving it sl different splits is going to be better. Obviously, you want to try and, you know, the, the most ideal situation is that you're giving the model um, relatively few training examples and you're, and you're reserving the majority of your data set for testing because that's more natural, that's a more, uh, uh, it, that replicates the actual um, application of the model in the real world because you have obviously uh, lots of it unseen imagery that you need to predict. But in this case, I'm using about double my training files. Um, that's also fairly common. Uh, if, you, if, if you don't know what number to use, then I'd say use, use twice as many training files as you have uh, validation and testing files. And if, you're able, and if you have enough data that you can actually split it into those three different groups, then that's best. Just to reiterate from yesterday, the training data is used to set the weights and reset the weights in the model iteratively. The validation data is used internally by the model to report how well the model is doing as it trains. But those data aren't used by the model to set the weights. So they're not actually used in the solution. Um, so they are an independent set among uh, themselves and they could be used for testing too. But it's even cleaner, I think, to use, an, and it's even more convincing to use a, a, a third set where the model has never seen it as your testing set, if you're able. Um, so once again, we're, get, we're gonna train this model. So this time we're gonna just use um, five epochs again, like we did yesterday, just because we don't have time for more. Um, and I'm gonna skip through to, uh, to actually get it running because um, it takes a few minutes and then I'm gonna go back and explain what I just did. Okay, so you'll, you'll hopefully recognize this code from above. Um, this time we're, we're giving it a, 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 a file path with a set of weights. Uh, that it's going to write to. Uh, we're creating a training generator from our set of training files like we did yesterday and a validation generator and we're evaluating how many steps we want that uh, model to to pass through during every training epoch which is simply just the number of the files that we have divided by the batch styles. We want the model to see every image in the catalog during every training epoch but we don't want them to see them in the same order, which is why we use the batches. And we don't want them to see them all at once, which is why we use batches. What we're doing here is um, we're training a model from scratch. So we're not in, we're, this, this is the version that we, it's our baseline that we're gonna compare to later. We're, so we're not using transfer learning right now because we haven't loaded the weights to the file. The, um, if we were to, to, to load the weights at this point, we would use uh, the same, Uh, construct as we used yesterday and we'd give it you know some file that we had there we haven't we haven't got that to that point yet um, what we're doing is create is, is training a model that is I'm calling a cold start because it, do, it doesn't have any um, it's it's essentially starting 
like um, it, it's training with uh, random numbers for weights and it has to figure it out all from scratch um, how to do it. And you'll see that as it trains, you, you know, you'll have, you'll have different images to me because again, it's randomizing the batches um, and it's randomizing which one it's showing uh, in, in the validation image here. But hopefully you get a sense that it's even, it, even uh, from the first training epoch, it's, it's pretty good at finding the vegetation and distinguishing the vegetation from the rest of the categories. Um, and vegetation here is obviously a, a, a category that I have chosen specifically because it works. Um, but I would encourage you to, uh, again, redo this with other categories to see how well this works in general for other categories. But, but you can see that it's going through here. It's got onto its third epoch already. And you can already see that um, it's, it's doing an OK job at finding the vegetation. So our baseline in this case is going to be fairly good already. And what we're going to do um, in the next couple of examples is we're going to give it um, a set of weights that we trained the previous model on the previous data set, the Aeroscapes data set on vegetation. Uh, we're going to use the, uh, the version of those weights that were the outcome of five training ep epochs. And we're going to call that a warm start. And then at the end, we're going to use a, uh, a version of that same, uh, of those same model weights, but this time uh, from a model that was trained over a hundred epochs. And we're going to call that hot start. And we're going to see what the difference is between the cold, the warm, and the hot models as a demonstration of, of what you might be able to achieve if you use transfer learning on your data. Um, but while these models are training, I thought it would be a good uh, juncture to talk about the, the, a little bit more detail about the, the model that we are using. Um, just to recap from, um, from above, where we had the, the image of the unit, um, I realize this is, a, this is a difficult image if you're not used to looking at them, but essentially on the left-hand side, you've got your input image, um, which is your RGB image. And that's why it's got three bars. They're the three channels. I said, oh, well, actually, no, in this case, um, not sure what that's representing, but that, that first bar would be your image that then got sort of went through a convolution block. Um, you know, that's why there'd be sort of several lines stacked vertically here because it's going from one thing to the next to the next before it then goes through a, a significant pooling event, um, which is con uh, essentially cr crystallizing or condensing the features that the previous layer has extracted. But the, the main point uh, it really that I want to, to illustrate here is it's called, it's called UNET because it's U-shaped. Um, this first part of the, of the uh, model is called the encoder down to this point here. This point here is called the bottleneck. And then this, this, this expanding part here is called the decoder. And so it's a, it's a, it's a version of an auto um, encoder decoder network. It's auto because it figures it out itself, just like all neural networks do. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and also because it's encoding itself. Um, and the uh, encoder, because it's encoding that image into smaller and smaller and smaller uh, feature representations of those features until it gets to a bottleneck feature. And then it uses that feature along with all of the spatial information that it inherited from the, the progressive downsizing in a reverse way to essentially uh, interpolate back up again using the spatial, um, uh, the spatial relations that it, that it used originally. The gray lines, to recap, are those skip connections um, those long skip connections that essentially merge um, high level feature representations with lower level feature representations to provide um, a, a, to provide a sort of a hybrid of those two features that the model can then use to predict um, that 's what 's called the vanilla version of the unit that was the the original two thousand and fifteen paper uh, re, uh, implementation of the idea and then what we 're using is actually a slightly different version of the model. Um, that has what's called residual connections inside it. And so that's why it's called a residual unit. And I just wanted to sort of go over that at a high level, at least, before um, we sort of moved on here. But I can see that the cold model has now stopped training. So actually, what I'm going to do real quick is um, get the next model training, because that's going to take another five or 10 minutes, and that will give me enough time um, to explain the, the residual model. OK. so. Um, if you're still following, then what we're doing here is um, we're making an entirely new model. So we're just calling this, uh, this function yet again. Um, we're giving it a new path to store its weights to. It's the same as the previous one, except it's prepended by warm and not cold. 
And then what we're doing here, this is, this is the point. This is where the magic happens. This is where the transfer ha uh, learning happen, happens, essentially here. Load weights, because we're loading weights um, to the same model framework, same architecture, same everything, same hyperparameters, but with a different set of weights. And these are the weights that we learned from the es air escapes uh, vegetation problem over f uh, five epochs, um, like I said. So we initialize the model, we load the weights. Oh, of course, we don't have those weights because um, they, were, they were generated by my model training above. Um, so what can I do here? Um, so if everyone's not following why I just got that error, it's because I didn't run that model training, so I don't have that file. So that was an unanticipated thing on my part. So let me see if I actually do have that file um, for the purposes of moving on here. Um, oh, damn it. No, I actually don't have it. So we're going to have to skip that part, unfortunately. Uh, but you you should have it if you've run the the training above. I just don't have time to do it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move. Um, oh, do I have this one? Yeah. No, I have that one, right? Oh, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Okay. Something's gone wrong up here because I should have load. I should have got that file from somewhere. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I we loaded it right at the end of the first one. Uh, excuse me, bear with me just one second here. I lost my weights. Here we go. There they are. So this, this was the, the piece of code that we download. This was the file that was trained by myself um, over 100 epochs that we're now going to use um, to hot start our model. And um, unfortunately, that means we're not going to get to see the warm, but you should still see the warm if you go through the exercise. I hope that's clear to everybody. Let me know if that's not. Okay, so we're we're now we're we've now initial initialized and compiled our hot start model, and we've given it. This is the transfer learning part. We've given it those weights, and this time we're going to just train on top of that. Okay, so while that's training, um, let's go back to this idea of residual. Uh, or skip connections. All right, so what, you're, what we're looking at here is a figure that originally came from a paper by Drosdil et al, um, which introduced this idea of, the, of using um, residual connections with units. And it's now turned into uh, sort of an alternative version of the unit, and it, it works better for a lot of cases um, than the original version, which is why we're using it. Um, the idea behind this is that it's the same, essentially the same structure. You, you, you see the units, you see that the dimensions are approximately the same in this version of the figure. Um, and you can see that it has, every, it has these long range skip connections that we talked about earlier, but it also has these short range skip connections. And, what, and they're, called, they're otherwise known as residual um, connections. And there's a, a video that um, we're not going to look at now, but I, I do encourage you to watch it. It is a you know technical, it's a computer science video essentially, but hopefully it gives you an intuition of, of what this really is. But the, the essentially the idea is that as well, so every time that the, the these convolution blocks, um, sorry, every time the image features get passed into a new block, the skip connection will take a version of the feature that comes out of a particular layer, and it will just combine it. It will just sort of add it and concatenate it with. Um, a, a ver a, with the with uh, sorry, I'm getting lost. The it will take the that version of the feature map and it will just skip the next layer and just add it to the output of the next uh, feature map. So if, in this case, you have three layers. You ha your image um, comes into here, goes through these three, gets pushed through a pooling layer into this layer, which is now smaller, and then it gets pushed into um, the next layer, but before it does, it gets sort of skipped over and added back in. And the intuition behind that is that the each layer um, now sees not only the output of the previous layer, uh, but the output of the previous layer. So it saw the information that the previous layer saw when it made when it tried to make its uh, adjustment to the weights, as well as the output of that layer. If that makes sense. 
Um, it wants to know, it, the, the reason why this uh, um, allows for faster convergence and for deeper models um, and more powerful models is because it sees not only the feature representation that's the response of a particular filter, but also the information that went into that filter. So it gets to learn twice, essentially. We're using the same uh, version of that feature representation. Um, and I strongly encourage you to watch that video, which probably is a lot more eloquent in explaining that same principle. So um, the residual unit is the, essentially the version of the unit that we're using. And that's the one that I found to be more powerful in general for these types of, uh, these, these types of problems that we're looking at here, at least this type of scale. Um, we're on to the uh, training epoch four out of five. Um, go through, I, I want to just reiterate some of these scores that you're seeing just to sort of recap from yesterday. And we're about an hour into this, um, into this uh, clinic now, and we've got an hour, uh, one hour left. So we, we've still got quite a lot to cover, but um, the, the, what you're, the, 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 the numbers that you're looking at here, since the first one's the loss, that's the training loss. That's the current state of the model and where it's at in its loss space. Um, the loss is gonna be going down from a large number and converging towards zero. And as soon as it gets to zero, obviously it's a perfect model. So you don't ever get zero, you get a small number that's close to zero if you've done well. Your dice coefficient, um, conversely, that's a number that's scaled between zero and one. One, closer to one is, is, is optimal. But the things, um, the, the, generally neural networks are very good at fitting to data, right? They're, they're universal function approximators. They're very, very prone to overfitting to the data. And so a lot of the challenge, a lot of the art and the science that goes behind deep learning is to uh, regularize, reg, regularize the model, which means preventing it from overfitting the data, learning the general trend, the general patterns in the data, so it's able to perform on, on things that it's never seen before, but it's seen things like that. So the numbers that you really do need to pay attention to are the validation losses and the validation dices. There's no point having a model that has a dice coefficient of 99 if its validation dice coefficient is down in the 70s or the 60s or whatever. Um, that's the number that we're, we're, we're trying to maximize really. We're, we're trying to maximize both of them. We're trying to, we're trying to make sure that those two curves um, over, over time sort of converge to the same place. They may not get there at the same rate, uh, but they ideally they want to get to the same place and that's when you know that you have a good model and enough data so this so the the, the model now has stopped uh, the hot model has now stopped training um, so I'm able to make that comparison but because I didn't have the warm model I wasn't able to train the warm model right now I'm just going to go ahead and uncom uh, sorry and comment those out but you should see on if you've gone through this exercise um, more diligently than I have, then you should see those curves um, come out. I'm just going to have two curves to look at on every plot. You should have three. So interesting. The um, every time you get a different result, the, you can see uh, because you have different training batches and very few training epochs. So you'll everyone will see a slightly different version of the graph. But but most people will see in the end the red line has got a larger. Uh, uh, dice coefficient than the blue on average and a smaller loss. This is actually a pretty interesting case. This is uh, one of those cases where there's not a massive difference between them in the training data set, but there's obviously a huge difference between them in the, in the, in the validation set. Um, it's pretty interesting that, oh, oh no, that's right. So the hot model here is better for the validation set than the cold model on average and maximum, minimum, and mean and the um the hot model here has a smaller loss which is what we want and what we expect what's odd is that the loss is going up but i think that's just by virtue of the fact that we're just looking at a very small um number of training uh, epochs and that we would expect that to come back down again and i imagine you're all looking at very different things um so in general I've, I've run through this a few times in general the red line is is always better than the blue but whether or not the green line is better than the red line is, is, is completely dependent on the specific images that you saw over this number of training epochs. 
So don't worry if you see a gre your green line at the top, that's fine. Um, it's also an indication, I think, that this particular model for this particular data set and this particular class doesn't need a hell of a lot of um, uh, transfer learning to occur uh, for it to sort of get a kickstart on what it would otherwise achieve. Um, what I mean by that is, in this case, we trained a model for five epochs and we trained a model for 100 epochs and there wasn't a difference, there wasn't a huge difference in the ability for those two scenarios to, uh, to, to create a, an improvement in the model. They both worked about the same way. Um, but what we'd expect in this, in this um, case is, is then to just train a, for a small number of training epochs on one data set and then you're ready to start training uh, for real on your data set. And, in, and so in, in an ordinary scenario, you would keep that, that training going for much longer than five training epochs. You would probably choose something a number between maybe 50 and 150 in order to see how well that model gets to. And you'll see over time, the dice coefficients will go up and up and up and they'll start to asymptotically plateau. And then the loss function will do the same. It will hover uh, hopefully just above zero um, and stay there. If you ever uh, sort of encounter situations where your loss function just keep like your loss value just keeps on going up and up and up and up, obviously there's something wrong. You need to stop the training and fix the problem. It's not normal for the for the for the loss for the loss value to keep rising. It should just keep going down. Um, for the validation set, it may jump around quite significantly, but the general trend over time is that it's going down and down and that the variance of its jumps is getting smaller and smaller. So before I go on to the, oh, and I guess for the completeness here, let's, um, let's get the test scores for each model. This is the same piece of code that we saw earlier on with the other set. It's, it's just calling this image batch generator function one more time to grab a, a generator, uh, to, to describe a, a generator function based on these test files, not the training or the validation files. So we have our 25 test files there and um, we're going to evaluate each one of our models, but I'm going to comment out my middle panel here because I don't have that model. And what it's doing is just evaluating how well the model did. Um, based on the entire test set. And we'll should, we should see that the dice coefficients and, and mean IOU scores for this one are gonna be lower than they are for this one. That's the hope anyway, and that's what you should all see. Um, there's gonna be a lot of variation in the values that you see um, because you trained on different subsets. And I keep saying that, but it is important to understand that this is a random you know, is this a stochastic process that we train models with? We give models random batches of imagery and we do things to them that, that you know, that does, does not enforce consistency. But in the end, you should have a model that if it's trained over a sufficiently long period, you should have a model that um, does converge towards, uh, towards its, its ability um, and the consistency that you see um, should should increase, and so we have a situation here where we've demonstrated that a model that has been hot uh, hot started essentially by tra by transferring the weights from another training exercise that has uh, significantly it's sort of given us a ten percent increase in our dice coefficient um, um, straight off the bat. So it's a good starting point for you to do your model training with. And it might, it, you might even get to a situation just in a few, maybe a few more training epochs where uh, that's good enough and that you, you're done. Um, so this last piece, piece of code here before I take some more questions and move on to the next tutorial, that's just taking that, that hot model um, and just uh, um, and doing something with it. It's making a, making a prediction. And you can see that you know, that is not perfect, but it does a reasonable job of, of finding the vegetation. Uh, if anything, it's under predicting where the vegetation is because it hasn't found, in, in these particular examples, it's done a, a, a much better job at finding the trees than it has the grass. And I, I offer the reason for that is because we didn't see grass necessarily in our previous data set. Maybe that wasn't the best uh, class to use, but, but you'll also see that if you train these, these models for longer, then it will start to pick up the grass. So um, the grass is basically not detected yet, but we would expect that the model would learn how to detect the grass later on. 
um, it's going, it's, it's learned the trees because the trees have a much more uh, distinctive uh, uh, distribution of sizes uh, compared to lawns, which, you know, have a bigger distribution of sizes, I, I would imagine. Uh, but also, the, you know, the, the specific structure of, of these uh, leafy vegetation is very different from the grasses, which are obviously all kept, kept very short. And so they just have a very different texture to them, even if they have, even if they occupy um, a, a similar color space. So um, that's the transferring uh, learning, transfer learning sort of in a nutshell for this particular workflow. Um, I wanted to spend a lot of time on it because it, I, do, I do think that this will be a very common um, situation that you might involve, that you might encounter when transferring these ideas to your own data. Another couple of, I, uh, a couple of sort of general points that I wanted to make before I answer questions is that you know, typically you are using this sort of size imagery. This is probably smaller tiles of images than you're used to using. Um, and again, it's because of GPU memory limitations. We use a GPU, not a CPU, because the training times are in order of magnitude um, shorter. But the, the downside is obviously we're, um, we have a lot of memory issues when we're using very large images. And so we typically either chop them up into smaller bits or as here, downsize them. So with that, I'm going to have a quick look at the questions. And if everyone wants to ask me a question, now would be a good time. Per pixel confidence probability scores. All right, that's a good question. The, um, not easily. It, it, you're not, it's not a trivial thing to look at the per pixel probabilities. Um, we, all we have is a sort of a pseudo probability that comes out of our, um, of our, of our classifying layer. So if I go back to that, um, let me go back to that. If we go all the way back to our model, actually, we'll see in this line of our model, um, the classifying layer or, the, or what's, what's called the classifying head of the model is, um, is using an activation function called sigmoid. And so what that does is it gives you the, a measure of the probability of it being every class, or, or sorry, of it being that class, because we only have two classes in this example. Um, so that is a value between zero and one like a probability, but it's not really like a, pro it's not really a probability because it doesn't come from a joint probability distribution. The, what we have is a conditional probability distribution of, it, of, of the label given the image, but we don't have, so that's, you know, that's the P, P is Y bar X, but we don't have P is X comma Y, which is the joint distribution of, 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 the, of the image features and the labels. And that's not possible because we, that would have to be specified over the entire data set, whereas we only have um, that we have, we only have batches to work with at any one time. Um, but it's also a, a direct result of the, the model itself being a discriminant function. It's not a function that can generate probability distributions. It do, is not capable of specifying or evaluating or solving or inferring the joint distribution of the two. So what we have is essentially a discriminant function with an sigmoid activation function, which does give us a value between zero and one, with zero being, it's n there's no chance that it is that thing, and one being that there is that, that, that it definitely is that thing, and all the numbers in between. So that is also why, when it came to, let's scroll down all the way down to our batch function, our image generating function here. Oh, no, I didn't put it in there. Um, somewhere in here, I have this. Yeah, so in here, for example, this is also why we use a threshold of 0.5. So here I've made a note. So we use a sigmoid function, our classifying layer, that are like probability scores, but they're not true probabilities. If you said that to a statistician, she would say, no, that's not a probability. Um, but a, machine, a data scientist considers it a probability because it's just an entirely data-driven exercise. It has no theory behind it. So what we're doing here is, all I'm saying here is, I'm going to call it one if it's greater than 0.5. So in that case, that's a decision that I made, and there might be more uh, 
there might, there might be better ways to arrive at whether or not that really is the thing. Um, but that would be that would be on you to try and figure that one out. Um, but what I'm going to go, what I'm going to, I'm going to touch upon this issue again in the next lesson as well. So hopefully, if that wasn't entirely clear, maybe the next time I say it, it's a little bit more clear. Can we, instead of a binary result, actually get that continuous data between zero and one and look at that in a map? Uh, yeah, so, okay, we can do that right now. So if I did, um, if I just took, if I gave this a color bar, I'm gonna make it smaller because it'll look better. And then uh, here, I'll just get rid of that line. And I'll run this again. And this time you'll see a color bar next to every subplot. And that's going to show you where you are within that space. The, re the, the color map I've used here doesn't necessarily give you a good indication of that. So let me use something that's a little bit uh, better. What would be a good one? That one maybe? <laughs> um, this one's going to show reds and blues. So you can see that in this, in, in this case, uh, it looks like a lot of the values ended up being one. But there are many values on the edges that would be less than one. Oh, in this case, actually, you've got more than, there's some values that are more than one, which doesn't seem right, but maybe that's, maybe that's not right. But um, yeah, that's how you would essentially look at those, um, those sigmoid scores. Um, so it wasn't, it's not, it's not too much of a leap actually to just always do that threshold, but because a lot of the values end up sort of bunching up in the, in the point nines. Um, up to up to one, but um, as I say, you would you would probably figure that aspect out for your own particular problem. It would also change, obviously, if you had many classes, and you could use the relative scores or the overlapping scores in different ways. And that's sort of uh, that's a good lead into what we're going to cover next. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, let me just kind of one more look at the chat. Um, Leslie wants to see everyone's models. I'll let you guys uh, confer over that. So, oh, one person got a hot of, uh, I'm not too sure what that means. Um, so did the loss function and metrics you specify influence over under prediction? Um, Jason, could you explain what you mean by that question? Can you hear me? Yes. So you noted, you noted in this model that there was some potential under prediction in the vegetation. And I'm curious, you know, if we specify different metrics in the loss function, if, uh, if diff use of different metrics might push the model to predict more vegetation, be more aggressive, or be less aggressive in how it's classifying things. I was just curious if your, if your specification of the metrics you're using and the loss function you use kind of can influence how the model is predicting. Yes, it does, and that's a good question. So um, let me go back to the loss function that we're actually using. Um, the, dice func the dice loss function in our case um, is appropriate for the class imbalance issue. But because we're using um, three categories, I think you're right in that the, if, if the, perhaps a better way to do this or a, a better way to actually tease out whether or not the either, any one of these three classes is badly influencing the model would be to separate them out and give them their own loss functions or to weight the loss function. So you'll see examples of people using weighted loss functions if they have class imbalance even among the classes that they're looking at. So in this case, is we have class imbalance among grass and trees. And I don't know too much about the vegetation, but we certainly have fewer tree pixels than we have grass pixels. So that would be a case of a, a, a more, much more advanced case of using your own your custom loss function that would be a modification of an existing loss function that would weight those classes differently. And that's another way that you can get around class imbalance. Does that, does that address the question? <laughs> 
Yeah, it helps. Thank you. Okay. And um, yes, so th there's stochast there's stochasticity in here. This is why you're seeing different uh, scores, and um, a couple of people are seeing their cold model better than their hot model, perhaps. That is just a function of the, the, us training over um, very few numbers of training epochs. I would say that if you trained over many, many more, you would always see that hot one better. Uh, it's just, it just by virtue of the fact that uh, uh, one, one, sm one batch over, over these number of, um, over these number of uh, training epochs, they, they could just throw the model into a different trajectory that it takes a while for it to come back. So as, as you know, a way to vi visualize what this model is really doing, um, I, find it in, I find it intuitive and helpful to think of a lost landscape, right? So you have this, and that's, that's what a lot of people call it. You, you have this, this landscape that's full of um, hills and valleys. And one of, those, one of those valleys contains the optimal solution, right? Your learning rate sort of specifies how far you can jump across that landscape. And you may start, you know, at some point, you may be on the top of a hill, which is where you really don't want to be. Uh, but you may sort of descend through training, you sort of descend into maybe the first valley and you have a look at, around there to see whether the optimal um, solution is in here. And then you might have to sort of climb back out of that valley into a deeper valley. And it's the deeper valley that's going to find that, that you're going to find the, the, the actual minimum of the function. So the, the stochasticity is because you all start with random numbers when you're cold starting. You're, uh, you're introduced, so that's one, you, you're introducing random batches at different times and different um, chronologies, so that's another one. And um, it takes a long time for the model to figure out, it, you know, the, one of the reasons why we do train these models over hundreds, typically hundreds of epochs, is because it takes a long time for the model to figure out that it's in the right valley and that it needs to stay in that valley and just figure out, you know, where in the valley it needs to be in order to find the minimum. So hopefully that analogy is useful, but that's the reason why you're seeing this, this variability. Um, but if you all train that model for a hundred epochs and sent me the results, I'd be really interested to see them because that would be a good way to actually examine how much variability that does introduce. Okay. So, um, I'm going to address, there's one more question here about subdividing the classes, lumping or splitting. I'm going to address that in the next, in the next uh, tutorial, just for the purposes of, of completeness. I would like to move on from this one into the next one, if anyone doesn't have any more urgent questions. Hopefully that was convincing that the, that the transfer learning is useful, even though some of you are seeing uh, variation. Okay. Actually, before I move on to this, but just I wanted to um, uh, remember to say that. So this is the, going back to this is our this is our course website, the deep learning landscape classification that that you all started from, and you probably clicked that link in order to get here. Um, we're now moving on to um, to this one. We're using a, the, 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 the same model now, but for a multi-class segmentation problem. So we're going to be sort of estimating a few different features at once. Um, but I wanted to just go to the end here because I did manage to finish this uh, additional course. So this one, um, this one's a little bit more complicated, um, but I wanted to just sort of introduce it to, you folk, to those folks who really do want to take these methods and, and try and run with them. Um, this is a bit, this is a, a more uh, complete course because it shows you how to organize your data, how to generate the labels and, and, and how to deal with different label formats. It's also using a data set. Um, this is not my data set, it's fully acknowledged here, but um, we're using a data set um, that comes from uh, Duke University. Uh, it was used to train a model called, o o model called OysterNet. Um, and it was, it's basically for detecting uh, intertidal oyster reefs. And it's a much more difficult data set. Um, so there's a few uh, different strategies that I've gone through here. Um, but it goes through from scratch, like how to prepare the data set, um, different, you know, getting ready, getting everything ready, doing augmentation, things like that. Um, and then it, it steps through three different training 
strategies essentially and converges on a good solution in the end. And so it's a bit more of a complete uh, case study for specifically, you know, remote sensors on the call who are interested in these very sort of difficult problems. It, it turns out it's quite difficult to segment some of these reefs because the roughnesses are very similar to, to other roughnesses in the landscape. Um, so enough of that, but the, um, but that's, that's available. It's going to stay up there and you're quite welcome to, to look at that. And if you had feedback for me, that would be awesome because, you know, I'm trying to make these, these tools as accessible as I can. Um, so without much more of ado then, so you've got these two sites now. So without much more ado, let's move on to the, to, to the, to the second and the last part. We've only got half an hour left. So this is going to, we may not get to the end, but this is hopefully, or we may get there fast, but, um, hopefully this gives you, uh, a few ideas, some codes, um, and a starting point to, you know, a, a specific workflow that you might uh, combine some of these uh, models that you trained for binary segmentations. To reiterate what I said right at the start of yesterday, um, I, I find it valuable to treat segmentation problems with real world data, these messy data that we have. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm paying too much attention to the chat here. I'm going to minimize that just for a second. Um, treating this as a series of binary decisions. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Partly is because you don't always know what labels you need um, in order to make the entire segmentation work of your entire landscape for a multi-class problem. If you're just interested in one class, that's one thing. But if you're interested in many classes, what I'm talking about here is a workflow that's going to combine models that were trained on individual classes and then use a secondary workflow to then sort of deal with any, um, any mismatches or, 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 or weirdness that gets um, that, that's the result of that. And this, again, this goes as to Zoltan's question about, you know, if you're in a situation where you've got uh, very large imagery that you need to chunk, chunk up into smaller tiles, you know, it's conceivable that you could have uh, that the, the, the model working in prediction mode would segment that entire scene in such a way that, you know, one tile and the adjacent tile might have classes that don't overlap at the edges. And so this would be a way, this, this workflow that I've got in this particular workbook here is this would be a way to deal with that situation in, a, in, a, in an objective way. Um, but there would be many ways that you could deal with that situation using geospatial tools or, or or some form of logic that you came up with in order to um, assign uh, those 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 values. If you had a windowing approach, that is a good one. I mean, if you if you had a, a very large, let's say you had a satellite image and you windowed it, and then you had um, uh, you had predictions for every window, but there was a fifty percent overlap between the windows, for example, then you could use like a, a an average or a mode or whatever. But but this this uh, this workflow that I'm going to show you uh, right at the end here is you know a way to to deal with that using a, a more powerful uh, model called a conditional random field okay so i'm going to start by what we're going to do here we're going to load the same libraries and we're going to use the same functions as we did previously we're going to use the same metrics and the same models so I've skipped through all of that stuff because you've seen it all before and there's not, there's, there's not much to talk about here. So I really want to want to talk about, we've talked a little bit about hyperparameters as well. So really I'm going to skip here down. We're going to, again, we're going to use a batch size of eight and we're going to use an image size of five twelve. It does it, five twelve is just a number. It doesn't have to be, um, uh, in, on the log two scale. It, it, it could be any number. Um, oh, is that true? Maybe that's not true. For now, let's uh, just use 512. So um, we're going to download the Aeroscapes data again because we're in a different workbook now. So we need to go through that. Um, we're, all, we're, we're being back-ended by a different kernel, a different computer. So we need to re-download the data. But hopefully that doesn't take too much time. The um, Again, you're, we're, we're, we're using this Aeroscapes data. So that's the same data that we used at the start of yesterday. So that's, uh, we're going back now to, um, you know, our, our vegetation, our sky, roads, um, and things like that. This should be familiar to you because it's the same code that we used uh, yesterday in order to ascribe uh, colors to labels. I'm using a combination here of HTML color codes and in, inbuilt colors. 
Um, it doesn't matter. It knows how to deal with both. And here I'm making my model again. I'm using the same uh, optimizer as yesterday. I'm using the same loss function, the same metric. I'm not this time keeping track of the, uh, of the mean IOU score. That was just for the purposes of illustration. The metric that I really care about is the dice coefficient for the reasons that I've already explained. And again, this is a, 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 the, the files that we're going to use uh, to enforce some level of consistency among our respective outputs. But that's not to say that we're actually going to get exactly the same um, outputs. And I think you've already learned that lesson. The number of training files, again, is double the number of testing and validation files. That's not for any particular reason. It's just a, um, it's just a rule of thumb that I happen to have applied here. OK, so what we're going to do, uh, instead of waiting for all of these models to train, um, I've got all of these models already trained for a subset of these categories. I ended up choosing just the categories I was really interested in. Um, I'm segmenting the landscape in this sort of pretend example here, so I don't need, I don't really want to know where the boats or where the people or where the animals are. I'm more interested in where the buildings are, which is what construction is, where the obstacles are, which is just things like fences and posts and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I assume it's obstacles because this is for some sort of robotics application, but they're sort of obstacles to some sort of device or vehicle. Um, my background class is sort of my catch-all class uh, that contains lots of landscape elements that don't quite fit into construction, vegetation, roads, and obstacles. So all of these files, again, they're all hosted on uh, Google Colab. I've just downloaded them. They're all H5 files um, that contain model weights. The model is the same model that we used before. We just, I just basically pointed um, the model to to these uh, six classes and had it go through the process of, 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 of training on those classes. Now, you probably have realized that that is not the most efficient, computationally efficient way to do things. But, and, and of course, there are models out there, of course, and including the UNET that, will, will, um, that you can adapt to multi-class segmentation problems. You just set things up in the same way, um, but it, it keeps track of all of the different classes all at once and sets up a different loss function for each and sort of averages them or combines them in the end. Um, but what we're doing is, 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 the, is, a, is a, I'm proposing a different way, which is to essentially treat the, to exploratory, uh, in an exploratory fashion, uh, look at these individual classes. And we're, in, we're sort of simulating a situation here where you may have classes, you may have inherited some initial classes, and you want to see how well they work before you added more. Or you may be on the fence about whether or not a certain class might actually work, and you've gone down the, the, the you know gone down the road of of creating a few of those labels from imagery, and now you're in a position where you're like, okay, I want to see how well this 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 label is going to work, um, and I'm going to sort of do that for a few of my labels. Um, and so what I'm the, the workflow that I'm showing you here is a sort of a very specific one. Um, that is not particularly common even, but I think is uh, one that's worth exploring for those reasons. Um, it also allows you to examine the errors in, um, in isolation. Oh, and of course, I don't, <laughs> I don't have that file. Why do I not have that file? Um, bear with me just a second here. I don't know why that has given me an error now. Um, what this piece of code is doing, so th this is just a very efficient way of loading um, all of my models in, but really it's just uh, replicating something like model vegetation equals res unit uh, size. This is where I'm adding my third dimension. If I had a single band image, I would just leave, leave that as size. But because I've got multiple bands, I'm just sort of using some tuple math there to add them together, um, and then my batch size, right? And then I'm using, I'm saying, okay, model vegetation compile is the next line of each one, and then uh, load weights would be the third. And all I'm doing here is is making that uh, more efficient in terms of coding because I have a list of these classes that I'm interested in. And so, and because the, the, the way that I construct each model is going to be the same, um, I'm, at, you know, I'm essentially just uh, 
making uh, using the exec command, which is similar to the eval command in MATLAB, where you can just evaluate a statement and it will just execute that statement. And so it's a really useful, uh, if a little advanced way to sort of make that more efficient. But essentially all it's doing is this, but it's just doing it in a, in a, in a for loop. So I just need to spend a, a, just a second here trying to figure out why, um, what's going on here and I, I imagine everyone else is getting the same issue it's telling me that that file is not found air escape weights vegetation you resonate eight so i'm i'm seeing that file i don't know about you guys interesting Um, if anyone wants to chime in here, they could give me a hand. I don't understand. Is anyone else seeing that same thing? Uh, I got the same error, Dan. Hmm. Well, I'll be darned. And I didn't, but I, but I was having problems downloading one of the zip files for the images in the other script. Oh, well, there's, there's some weird thing going on here. So, uh, just for the purposes of moving on, I wonder if um, it's it's being. I imagine this is just caused by the no. Uh, I'm I'm looking at this, I think, and I just can't see it. What the issue is? <laughs> it's telling me that those files don't exist. Can I get, it did. It didn't take very long to download these files, so. I'm going to just nuke them all, get rid of them, refresh, they're all gone, and then I'm going to re-download them. And hopefully this time they work. Oh. So, okay, they're too small. So something is happening here which means that for whatever reason these files aren't getting downloaded um and that's not something that's that's not part of the script that's something that i don't have control over unfortunately it looks like unless anyone has any smart suggestions those files um they exist on my google drive so i can just i'll tell you what i'll do I don't know why I think it's just some glitch with either Google Colab or with Google Drive at this moment in time. So what I'm going to do is uh, just load them in from my computer uh, because you can upload files using this. So I'm just going to go and find those files on my computer real quick and upload them um, so I'm able to finish the rest of this class. We've only got 20 minutes left. Um, while I do that, has anyone got any questions for me? Apologies for this, I was not anticipating this. Those files should be five megabytes, and um, they're not. They're only uh, a few kilobytes, so something happened. Um, oh, man, I don't even know where this stuff is. Okay, there it is. Sorry, Dan, quick question. Uh, yes. I'm not typing in the chat because I'm actually watching on my phone and it's too awkward for me. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, go ahead. Uh, just how long are these are, are these notebooks going to be available for us to use and play with? Oh, they'll be, they'll be available until um, they become obsolete. Ah, okay. I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep them up there. All right, um, perfect. Yeah. yeah. If we make uh, a that's copy, sort of the we, point. yeah, we can play with Yes, them. please, yeah. yes, yeah, make, yeah. Make, make a copy. I, I strongly encourage you to, you know, there, there's a lot of difficult material in here. So, I, you know, this isn't the sort of class that you're going to walk away from feeling like an expert. But I think uh, my, my, my goal here is to expose you to these workflows, really to enable you to replicate them yourself, but also to, you know, to sort of give you an indication of what sorts of things are possible and, and the types of workflows that, that are common with this type of work. That doesn't mean that you know these. There's not some you know idiosyncrasies in the in the way that I have done this, but um, oh, but um, but but yeah. As I said right at the start, you know it's it's going to take you probably. It might take most people a few run-throughs to 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 really understand a lot of these difficult concepts. Um, 
Oh, I don't know why this is happening. So, um, these files should just load in, but they're not for whatever reason. Is everyone having the same problem as me? So it's telling me that they're five megabytes. Let me see if I can just do this real quick. Apologies for this. It was, it was going so smoothly too. Um, let me just see here if I can just read one of these files in, um, because otherwise we're not going to be able to do the rest of the lesson. Um, live coding. Works for me. Compiler, and then I give it a loss. So you have to, in order to work with the model, I think I mentioned this yesterday, but in order to work with the model, you have to compile it. Um, even if you're using it in prediction mode or transfer learning mode, you, you still have to compile it. It still needs to know what metrics to pay attention to. Okay, so, I, oh, so um, metrics. Oh, what am I doing? Optimize, oh. Okay, so then the next thing I should be able to do is model load weights. And then air escapes. You can see how bad I am at typing now. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry, guys, but I'm, I cannot see what the problem is here. I see that file. It has the... Oh, it doesn't have the right size. Something weird. Something weird's going on here. Um, all right. Well, just for the purposes of getting through this, apologies. I, I honestly have no idea what happened there. Those yeah, files should. Those, yeah, those I can share my be. screen because they ran, and you could walk through it. Um, well, it's okay, Chris, uh, because I've already got it. I can do that too here because I've already got the outputs. But but thanks anyway. I think I'll just keep going here and plow through. Um, I will, of course, I will troubleshoot this immediately after I get off the call. Um, so you should be. It shouldn't impact you too much. But um, what I'm what I'm doing here is um, I. I I, I set that up in such a way that it was going to load uh, six different different models for six different classes. It was going to compile them and load the weights that were, were, were downloaded. But what's happened is that I can't seem to load a version of those weights that seem uh, like they're fully loaded because they're not the file sizes and it's complaining at me because it can't find the file signature. Um, but let's assume that those models were uploaded with the right weights. Then this is just an, an exercise here of just really just reiterating what we did at the start of yesterday's lesson, just sort of seeing what that looks like, how to plot it, what labels we have. Um, but this part here, this takes a very long time, which is why I commented it out, because I didn't anticipate uh, having enough time in the class. Turns out I was right. Um, but what this does is essentially, it just cycles through each of those models that have had the weights loaded in. So they're now useful for prediction. And it's just using that same, uh, uh, that same piece of code that we used uh, previously uh, to create a test generator, to evaluate the number of steps, and then just to evaluate the model based on the, the entire data set. And so what I got when I did that, uh, these are, this is the output that I got. Uh, when I did that. So you can sort of see these, uh, the output for six of those six different classes in this order. Um, so vegetation uh, was about 97% uh, correct, uh, background 94. The, um, the, these two classes here, oh sorry, th this class here and this class here were the worst. So that was um, const obstacle and sky and then um, road did pretty well. So in general, there's, there's been a bit of a mixed bag here, and that's good because we want to uh, demonstrate a specific uh, principle at the end. But we've got very strong classifiers. Uh, so, you know, a few of these, I sort of can't, anything above 80%, I'm going to call good. 
And, um, you know, so four out of the six are, are pretty good in that regard. But um, we're going to combine those two together and then use another machine learning model to actually try and figure out um, whether or not there's some room for improvement on every specific image. And the algorithm we're going to use for that is called a conditional random field. All right, and I can't I can't run these 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 um, these cells, but I can tell you that th this is this is one where I've just loaded in a sample image, and uh, I want its original size, and I'm just circling and just cycling through those models and making a prediction for for each model, and I'm storing the prediction and the ground truth, uh, resized version, downsized version, in uh, oh sorry, um, the actual size version into two separate lists, into the M list, which is uh, for the for the model and the T list, which is for the ground truth. So M stands for model in this case, and T stands for truth. Um, <laughs> and um, it's it's using each model to predict each uh, to each, predict each class and creating a separate binary mask. So what we have is then a stack of these binary masks that we need to somehow combine into our multi-class segmentation, which is going to be the end result. Um, and in order to to flatten these these uh, these th this stack of uh, masks, we just simply sum over the first axis, and that's just going to essentially uh, take all of these binary masks, which is just zeros and one, and it's just going to sort of condense them down. But that's it's going to give them different values because I use this counter up here. So I'm basically cycling through this. I've initialized the counter of one, and so one is now vegetation. Next time it comes back through this loop, counters on two, and that's background, and that gets assigned two then to those pixels that are background, three to construction, four to obstacle, five to road, and six to sky. And so in the end, then you have this sort of this this array that's just uh, values between one and six, but it might not be integer values because um, there might be um, uh, the same class may have been predicted over the same pixel. So that's the situation that we need to deal with. We don't want there to be two classes per pixel, so we need there to be a secondary process to sort of go through each image on a task-by-task -task basis in order to evaluate how likely either of those two classes were. So if you have a certain pixel that's um, called one thing, then that's not a problem. It is consistently called that thing. But if you had a, another pixel that's called two or three different things by, the, by two or three different models, then you need a sort of a different process to sort of tie the room together at the end. And that's what I'm demonstrating here. And that's, that's, what, that's what the CR, uh, conditional random field is for. So, um, and I'm doing, uh, I'm, 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 I'm deliberately resizing stuff because, well, partly because, uh, you know, the model was, uh, as we know, it was trained on 512, 512 and it would be upsized into its original size, and that's common. Um, but the, the artifact of, of the, 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 the implication of resizing the labels is that uh, you might get some interpolation uh, strangeness uh, in those areas that have been resized near the boundaries of the labels. So um, this, this basically goes through a process of, of, of seeing, okay, okay, what does that look like in its sort of uh, raw form? And you can see that there's a lot of uh, sort of high frequency noise in these labels near the boundaries because of that resizing that's gone on. It, it got resized down to make a prediction and then we had to resize it back up again in order to make the, um, to, uh, uh, to, to get it to the same size that we want. So one strategy, um, a simple strategy and a common strategy that you're probably familiar with is to use a filter. You would just use a filter to pass over that and sort of smooth out some of that higher frequency noise. And so what we're really interested in is then preserving the actual boundaries of those labels as best we can. But it's a fairly naive way uh, approach because we don't know what size to use. And that size might actually be different optimally for different images, you know, especially if you've got a different perspective. Um, but also because of the, just the very specific nature of how boundaries might uh, interact at their, sorry, how classes might interact at their boundaries. So that, you know, the, the, the median filter that I've implemented here, I just took a number 15 and it seemed to work okay for that image. But I guarantee that that, that number wouldn't necessarily work uh, equally well for all images. And really it's not a very sophisticated way of dealing with the problem because it's not learning anything. It's just smoothing over where the labels are. But if, so a better way um, to deal with this problem, in my opinion, is, is, this, is, is the use of this conditional random field. And that sounds like a very complicated thing, and it is, but um, it is a very powerful algorithm um, that, that gets you uh, much, uh, that, that's very useful for post-processing um, 
your um, your model outputs, your segmentations, for both binary and multi-class segmentation problems, and for uh, models other than UNet, and for model approaches other than merging binary classes like what we're doing here. So, for example, many many of the state of the art uh, neural networks out there for multi-class segmentation, they have some form of a conditional random field in their in their in their in their processing. Of, often, um, that's often this the, the very last thing that it does um, in order to just tidy up that segmentation on a task by task or a task specific basis. And what I mean by task is a, a single image. So what it takes is uh, it takes your your bad labels, which could be your ground truth if they've been resized, or it could be your model output um, if it has some error. And it, and it tries to figure that out. It tries, to, it tries to relabel those portions of the image that have been labeled incorrectly. And the way it does that is by basically uh, producing a, it, it uses a machine learning algorithm to figure out what the likelihood of every class is given the information that has been presented to it. Um, the, there's many, many details about this algorithm that I no, don't now have time to explain, but I will encourage you to read the paper that I wrote on this topic um, a couple of years ago. Um, it, it really demonstrates how powerful a conditional random field approach is um, for cleaning up the, these, these types of data and, and these types of segmentations. And the reason why it's so powerful is because it uses both, it, it, it takes your your label and your image, it, it creates a probability distribution that is a generating probability distribution. So it's able to evaluate px given, uh, sorry, pxy, px comma y, the joint distribution of the image and the labels together. And it does so by uh, essentially passing a kernel across the image that evaluates the spatial structure of the image features with respect to each class and also the color space structure associated with uh, with uh, of, of every class and and their features so it's a very very powerful model and the math uh, behind it is very complicated but that doesn't mean that we can't use it if we don't understand what it's what it's doing it is controlled by a few parameters that end up being hyper parameters that we have to decide um, and I've given you some uh, numbers uh, in here that seem to work pretty well for most cases. So I would encourage you, if you are interested in this, to start with that paper and other papers that have used the conditional random field, and then start with this function to explore some of these ideas, but, but also be prepared that uh, these parameters might actually change depending on your specific uh, needs and your specific case. Um, and apologies for having to do this quite fast at the end, but I did want to get this uh, get to the end here. So what we're looking at um, above here, this was just uh, a few examples using the median filter, and I wanted to to sort of contrast that against the uh, the same the same thing, but using the conditional random field instead. And so what it's doing is essentially passing these uh, passing these kernels over the image. Uh, essentially generating uh, probability distributions that, um, uh, that convert uh, features into classes and then uses that to sort of uh, evaluate how likely every label that we have given it is and it may make a decision to unlabel and relabel it um, if it feels like that's a mislabel and that, so that's a very powerful thing for both um, for cleaning up the segmentations that might be the output of a model, but it also conceivably is a good way to clean up your label data that you give it in the first place. If you're going through the process of manually annotating imagery with polygons, uh, you might consider using a, a, a model like this in order to actually genu generate fine scale labels from the image, but that's, that's going to be something that we can talk about um, after the class. So here I'm, I'm running through and I'm essentially running this, uh, this function which is implementing this conditional random field on every uh, predicted label and, and also every true label. And I'm doing it on the true labels because there could be some error in those, but also for the most part because they're being resized and so there's some interpolation artifacts there. And you can see that in the end it does a, it does a reasonable job um, at, at sort of at, at dealing with some of, these, um, some of these labels and combining um, the labels in such a way that you, you don't have to get involved or set thresholds or or do anything uh, super specific um, in the decisions that go behind combining labels where they overlap. So that was a super 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 fast run through of that 
tutorial because um, we spent more time on the previous one. But hopefully, I may have lost a few folks on the way there, but hopefully this is something you can circle back to. Um, you all have my email address. I'm very, I'm very happy to answer emails um, on these topics. I am going to keep these, uh, these, two, um, these two websites going, as I said. Um, I'm going to return to the questions now on the chat just for the last uh, few minutes here before we have to wrap up in, in um, and, but if you have any questions about anything at this point, then um, please let me know. Oh, actually I should mention, so you can, um, if you don't know this already, you can download these as Python files or as um, IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks that you can run. Uh, you can run, you don't have to run these on Colab. You can download them and you can run them on your own machines. Um, if you need help with, you know, setting up the, 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 the environment, then I can sort of email that around um, after the fact, or I can even update the presentation to sort of explain that. Um, there's a lot of detail in here. This isn't necessarily something you're going to have, a, you're going to have fully full grasp of right now, but I was more concerned about giving you something that really worked and something that you could build off of. Uh, so even if your Python skills aren't sufficient yet to, to understand everything that's going on here, and if your understanding of machine learning is insufficient to understand everything, hopefully I've, I've at least demonstrated that, this, that these sorts of things are possible, and hopefully you're able to take these workflows and, and, and use them for your own purposes. Okay, so I'm going to go over to the, uh, the chat real quickly and see if anyone's got any more um, Questions, yes, restarting my kernel was a good idea that I didn't think of until too late. Um, there is a recording. Um, I've linked to some resources in the website that you can uh, start from and they have, they have links and textbooks from them. Uh, the website I'm talking about is, is uh, are these websites. Uh, there's links in there. Um, let me see what else we've got here. Um, we have to downsize the images because they have to fit on our hardware. So our hardware in this case is GPU. Uh, but if you had uh, limited RAM, then your CPU would struggle too. So that's the main reason. It's really just dependent on, on the, uh, the specific uh, computing uh, power that you have. Um, the GitHub, yes, there is a GitHub repository. Um, I can send that around. That's, so these websites actually, uh, they are GitHub repositories. So they're, well, sorry, they're GitLab repositories because GitLab does a better job at, or has traditionally done a better job at continuous integration. So I could just push changes to this and it just uh, automatically um, updates that, but I'll send that around. Um, and Chris asks is there's, if there's an environment.yaml file. There isn't, but I can certainly make one and share that around. And I'll, I'll actually, I'll end up, probably uh, just adding a last page to this website that has that you could download or something or has it as an as a explanation. Um, but we're, at, we're now at two o'clock, so I think we're gonna have to call it. Um, hopefully you got a lot out of that. Um, please stay in touch. Thank you so much for, for joining me today and yesterday. It's been a blast. Um, I will stay on the line for a few minutes as long as uh, CSDMS allow me to, and I'll continue to ask answer questions that you have. Um, but I imagine at some point Chad is going to just drop, uh, is going to uh, kick me off, at, at which point we're done. But uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Great Dan. Job. Really nice. Yeah, so, good. Yep. Really Very good. welcome. Thanks. Bye bye. Hey, Dan. Hey. Um, I'm just curious if there's any way to look into any kind of inference that the model is doing and how it's making some of the classification <laughs> decisions, because it seems like we're losing some inference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what we've done here is um, a, a four hour deep learning class that could easily be four days or even four weeks. And, and so some of these things I've obviously brushed over, but that's a great question. So I'm gonna to go to my, my um, browser here. Oh, you can't see my screen anymore. The, um, the, the technology that you're after is called class activation mapping. 
And what it does is it shows you a heat map of where in the image is important for every prediction. So if you're looking at trees and it's classifying as trees, then your heat map should show up as relatively high values over those trees, for example. Uh, we didn't have time to cover it in this class, but there's a number of um, Keras implementations that you could use, uh, that you could find online that you, you could easily build from if you, if, you had the, if you had the patience. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can do that Googling. <laughs> yeah, so look, look up CAM, Class Activation Mapping, and GradCAM, Gradient Class Activation Mapping. And it sounds really complicated, but it's not really that. It's not super complicated. It's at least not, it's not very complicated to implement with code. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much again. You're welcome. Hi, Dan. Uh, thanks for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. So question, can we, can we actually apply these units to classify different uh, vegetation types, um, like with multispectral images, so not only RGB? Uh, yeah, you could adapt this to multispectral images. Um, so in, in the, you'll see in all of the lines of code where we actually um, initiate a model, we've got the size, right? And the size we used was 512 by 512. And then I added three to the end, right? And I, I added just those, I added three bands to my model input because I had an RGB image and so it's three bands. But if you had a four band image, you could just add four and it would do the same. Or if you had a five band image, for example, you could add five and it would, it would do the same. The, I'm not gonna say that it will work the same or function the same or have the same accuracy or anything like that because that's gonna depend on your data but, um, and, your, and your classes and various other factors. But in theory and in practice, yes, you can for sure. Um, there's, there's so many examples of that. If you, if, if you look inside the remote sensing literature, um, search for hyperspectral units or something, you'll, you'll already see that a number of people have implemented things like that. Cool, that's very nice, thanks. You're welcome. Then Alejandro has two questions and they're in the chat. Oh, okay, um, let me see those. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see those. Um, different sizes. Right, yeah, so if you've got these big format images, um, then for sure you have to chop them up into this, in, so they're the same size. Um, subdividing into smaller windows. Yeah, so I think um, that's definitely how you deal that. Um, oh, right, and the, the Apologies. Yeah, I was meant to get back to the lumping and splitting, but obviously my technology failed right in the middle, right in the middle of it. Um, lump. Yeah, that's a that is the golden question right there. Um, that is very difficult to answer. So the question is, do you lump if you have classes that are the same? Uh, do you try and lump them together or do you try and maintain the splits as best you can? And unfortunately that really does depend that, that's gonna that's that really does need experimentation to try and figure that out that one out. I've 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 gone through this many times um, in my own research where the initial set of categories that I thought were gonna work well ended up having to be modified based on initial trial. So I'd go through the process of labeling using those images, uh, using those classes. I generate a small set of labels um, and I would train a model just to see how well I think it might do. And at that point, you know, it becomes clear that you maybe have to combine similar, uh, similar classes if they're being mispredicted. Um, in general, I think you're combining more than you're splitting, but it really does depend, I think. You know, if, it, it really does depend on, on your data and how resolved those features are within the data and how different those features are among classes. If you have two different vegetation types that are basically exactly the same, then uh, you know, if, if for all intents and purposes, you know, they have the same range of colors, they have the same uh, ge general texture or whatever, then it's going to be difficult if there's no if there's no really strong spatial or zone, zonation signal in there, or any really other sort of uh, covariate that it can sort of use in order to make that call a, a lot of this stuff as well like i should say is you know it, it's as much an art as it is a science you have to it's it's numerical modeling but it's it's in a very different way than you may be used to and you do you do have to develop an intuition over some of these things and that really it does come through experience but especially when it comes to to whether or not you you lump or split classes <laughs>
I hope that I hope that answers the question. That's the best I can do. I I think it does. Um, and I see Will has another question, uh, also in the chat. Um, does variation of your size or perimeter complexity matter with your with your labels? Um, yes, it does. Uh, the perimeter is is obviously a big one because it needs it, it's it that's the hardest place to actually label right at the boundary of two things um because the you know the that boundary the the, the location of that boundary and the crispness of that boundary gets modified by the model uh, so your features have to be spatially strong enough to deal with the fact that you're sort of like you know you have these two adjacent things um, and and the size matters because of the the class imbalance problem Thanks. So uh, my, I don't know if my mic is on, but um, so with the size, then is it good to sample across a range of sizes? Like, let's say you've got sediment, different um, patches of sediment of the same composition mm -hmm. that um, are different sizes. Um, do you, presumably, then you want to capture all of that that size range as part of your labeling process. Um. So when you so what do you mean exactly? So the size range, the size of the image, or the size of the oh sorry, the size of the sediment patch. Um, so if um, you know, like I say, I work with gravel bedded rivers, but sometimes uh -huh. you get in cer certain environments, you get um, de uh, ephemeral deposits of finds, and okay. you know they might be two square meters, or they might be. 50 square meters. Um, so as far as defining your labels, then do you want to try and uh, capture that size variation with your labeling? Um, I, I guess I still don't quite follow. I mean, I, I definitely see, I see a situation where your gravels have been filled, but I don't understand what you mean by the size of the label. Like that, what you're labeling is what it, whatever size it is, you're labeling it, right? So, do you mean the? Uh, sorry, I mean, you mean the, the image resolution? Oh, the polygon. Yeah, well, yeah. you'd you'd want your polygon to be the same. You'd want your polygon to completely cover the entire thing that you're interested in. So, in your case, it would be gravel. You know, you'd want your your polygon to to cover the entire gravel patch. But in your case, though, it's going to be more. You know, dis distinguishing between different grain sizes is going to be tough because. The um, because of all of the downsizing that happens in the imagery potentially. So you'd want to keep, you'd want to split your image up. If you had a big, large image, you just, I think you should just split your image up into smaller images, but you, you preserve the size of the, the actual size of the pixel. Um, and then when you're mm. labeling, you're labeling on those tiles and you can either decide if the tiles are really small, you can either decide to just give it a single number value, like, that's gravel, that's sand, that's silt, that's gravel, that's sand, that's silt. Or you could actually go through and, you know, seg uh, do the polygonal labeling on those smaller tiles. But uh, if you want, well, uh, send me an email and we can pick this up over, over an email conversation. Yeah, yeah, sorry to tie it up. Yep. No, that's okay. I, I, I just don't know how long Chad and Albert here have got, uh, that's all. <laughs> I, I got one question, but I see Alejandro has, uh... And one more question about splitting images and if you need to have an overlap on those tiles. Right, or... right. So, I, yes, yeah, so as I said, um, I probably, you probably missed it because I was saying it quite fast. But, but a good strategy is exactly what you're saying, to, to split the, la the images up and the labels up uh, such that there's a big amount of overlap because then you've got more to deal with. You've got more computation that you need to do because, you know, if you've got 50% overlap, you're essentially doubling the amount of work that you need to do. Uh, but right, as you say, the edge issues with the labeling, if you have multiple versions of that label for every pixel, then you've got more information to make a decision about, a decision with. And I, I don't want to hold you up too long then. And no, it's this, okay. This was awesome. And I've always, cool. always want to, you know, get more into machine learning. So so maybe this, this will push me over the edge in doing so. Yes. Um, I'm interested in uh, detecting water, which is pretty easy i think only mm -hmm. for satellite imagery so mm -hmm. we, we've done some simple stuff on uh, 
uh, modus, but I want to uh, use fears, for example. And I'm, I was wondering if if there are some good labeled data sets out there already for satellite data that you can point me for to. water. Yeah, there is. Yeah. There's a lot. Um, let me have a look here. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called. But, um, oh, I, I can tell you this real quick. So I can tell you that the, these models work well for water. I've, I've put together a class um, for detecting lakes and mm. that worked pretty well from Sentinel two imagery. Yeah. Um, I also know that I've used this model pretty, it's quite effective of pulling out, um, for my personal research, I have to pull out the land from the surf zone from the ocean sea. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty good at pulling those out as well. Uh, so that's a form of water detection. Let yep. me, um, there, I'm just trying to look up here a, I'm trying to find a link to something that I found that had, it was essentially a global water polygonal data set. Um, I'm just struggling to find it. Because in the end, what we would like to do is, you know, every day there is somewhere on earth flooding. And right now there's in yeah. Michigan because there was a dam bre breach, right? right. And there's uh, this, this cyclone hitting uh, Bangladesh. Um, so we want to capture those events and, and provide flooded area or flood extents mm -hmm. to the various relief agencies. And we do that right now already, but I think we can optimize this. Uh, so I want to do it, do it for optical data, but in the end, I would love to do it also for radar data as well, but that, that's a whole different category, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, um... Uh, I apologize, I can't find this this data set. I, I do have a copy of it. So if, if you send me an email, maybe I'll just send oh, yeah. you the email later on. Um, but that's what you need. But, but then going back going back to what you're saying, yeah, I think um, I'm fairly confident that this model would get you at least most of the way there um, for detecting water. I, I'm not too sure how well it would transfer, you know, between different types of satellite imagery, for example. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's like, you know, different bands um, or different sensors, yeah. But I would, I imagine that it would, it would work pretty well for the case that you're describing. I don't know about you know really super specific cases like really optically clear water or very yeah. shallow water or you know. But I certainly imagine deep pools of water that are that are optically opaque. I imagine this is going to work pretty well with. Okay. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, and definitely water. You know, there there are certain areas in the world where the water is so sediment rich that it, it yeah, exactly. its color is you know towards brownish instead sure. of this dark black, and that it might yeah yeah. But but even there. but even in that case, so uh, when when I put together a, a course that looked at lake detection, hmm. there was a lot of muddy lakes and a lot of really dry lakes, a lot of drying up lakes, um, you know, the Aral Sea and places like that, which yep. which you know very. The, the the color signatures of all of these different lakes across the world were very different, but the models still managed to be able to reliably tell where the sh where the water was. So, cool. and I don't know if that would like necessarily transfer to like the real extreme members of the of of like water bodies like hypersaline lakes or mm -hmm. hyperturbid lakes or hyperturbid rivers, but I think for the most part, I think it would it would work okay. Cool, cool. Okay, I I will follow up with an email and yeah. Okay. Cool, that great. sounds good. This was awesome, Dan. Very, oh, yeah. Thank you very 